Um, thank you, everyone. Um, uh, it's a stunning uh, day here in Ngunnawal and the Gambri country. I just wanted to uh, begin by um, acknowledging their ongoing custodianship to this um, very beautiful uh, country at this time of year. Um, for those of you who are not here in, in Canberra, uh, the wattle is fully blooming. Um, it is part of um, one of those signs in many parts of the uh, Aboriginal country that we're well into first spring. Um, I wanted to particularly acknowledge um, the country that you're all coming in from, uh, and you can um, uh, acknowledge appropriately, um, and to welcome you here to um, this um, breakfast forum on Indigenous Australia, uh, global outlook, and um, and part of the the objective of this forum is to share with you uh, some of our reflections on uh, Indigenous engagement um, in a global world and, and perhaps some of the lessons uh, uh, that, that might have for governments. I wanted to uh, introduce myself. So I'm uh, Ian Anderson. I'm Deputy Vice Chancellor here at the Australian National University. Um, my background's in uh, as a public health physician. I um, have worked in government um, and also worked uh, uh, in the university sector for most of my professional life, mostly in the fields of uh, Indigenous uh, health and, and education. Um, I'm joined um, by Professor Maggie Walker, um, uh, a Palawa woman um, from the Parabana people, um, same, same clan groups uh, as myself, um, uh, from northeastern uh, Tasmania and uh, Maggie um, was the distinct or is the distinguished professor of sociology at the University um, of Tasmania and has um, recently joined a commission in Victoria, which uh, uh, she can tell you a little bit about in, in, in the introduction. Uh, and um, uh, Professor Tony Dreitz, who's Pro Vice Chancellor's uh, First Nations Education Research, University of Southern Queensland and Gumilaroi and Yulaili, uh, First Nations uh, of Northwest New South Wales, um, and um, a renowned Indigenous leader in policy and valuation, uh, a research in the field of education. So I might just begin by some, making some broad opening remarks. You have um, 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 housekeeping is posted uh, in, the, in the chat channel and if you would like to ask a question at any point, we'll just get us through our first set of comments. Um, I feel welcome to raise your hand and we can um, uh, have a conversation. Okay. So um, um, for well over half a century, um, Indigenous uh, Australians, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples has been actively reaching out globally uh, to um, um, to learn from other Indigenous peoples, uh, from other peoples who are struggling with issues of equity, uh, and to also uh, shape global thinking, um, and to, with a view to contributing to a global um, conversation around Indigenous issues for Indigenous peoples and other peoples who are um, confronted with uh, rights and civil rights agendas. One of the first um, 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 times this occurred was in the late 1960s and the um, early 1970s, uh, where uh, Indigenous activists, um, particularly in then in Redfern in Sydney and also in Melbourne and Victoria, began to um, talk to uh, and engage with uh, civil rights leaders, particularly in the in the Black civil rights movement in the United States of America, um, there are a number of kind of well recorded, um, and for some people who were there, <laughs> well remembered um, uh, uh, encounters between, particularly between the Black Panthers um, at the radical end of the North American civil rights 
movement and, and indigenous activists. And in one of those exchanges, um, an idea was shared about um, health and welfare organizations that were run by the black American community. This notion was called community control. And the idea of community control um, has become a very powerful part of the indigenous movement uh, here in Australia. Um, and that gave rise to uh, Aboriginal health services that were run and, and controlled by the Aboriginal community, education services, and a whole range of other uh, welfare and social services that were uh, community controlled. Again, picking up an idea that came from North America. Well, today, that service sector is worth over a billion dollars. And when I was last in government, I led a, a, a reform of um, what was a COAG, and then COAG, now National Cabinet Agreement, called Close the Gap. And it was the community controlled sector working together that significantly changed the outcomes of that agreement. Essentially, arguing that if we were to uh, move to, if governments were to move towards shared decision making, that uh, Indigenous Australia, re re represented by the community controlled sector, had to have a seat at the decision making table and be a part of the agreement and not just consulted in that agreement. And that agreement um, um, was um, re reasonably ground shifting. It was the first time that an intergovernmental agreement, in my knowledge, an intergovernmental agreement in Australia uh, had signatories on not, all, on not only the Commonwealth government and all the state and territory governments, uh, but in fact, a coalition of Aboriginal bodies representing Aboriginal, uh, 50 uh, Aboriginal community controlled peak organisations uh, in the country. So that was, that was um, a movement and a sector that grew out of uh, 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 reach out globally. That, that movement, uh, global movement, has had a strong focus around rights. The UN Direct Declaration of, uh, on Indigenous, the Rights of Indigenous People, signed in 2007, was uh, developed over 20 years through the various UN fora uh, and represented a place where Indigenous leaders uh, played a significant role in shaping the Indigenous rights agenda. And Similarly, in various professional um, movements, um, my, mine was in the Indigenous health movement, um, we began reaching out in the 1990s, quite deliberately from Australia, to work with Maori peoples, uh, First Nations people in, in the United States, Native Hawaiians um, and Canadian Aboriginal peoples on issues of health, health policy, health practice, um, and there are a number of kind of global associations that were set up. The one that was, I was most involved in was the Pacific Region Indigenous Doctors Congress, uh, which began when there are only about 50 Aboriginal doctors in Australia. And it, it significantly uh, accelerated the professionalization uh, um, of, of Indigenous health, the development of Indigenous medical workforce, uh, and transformation of medical education and, uh, and Indigenous health research uh, in this country. So I'm going to um, turn, I'm going to ask two questions of the panellists um, uh, and then we might open up some questions and I'll come back uh, to our final question about uh, 10 minutes before close. But I'm going to go to Professor Walter first and actually um, ask her to reflect Looking back over the last 12, 20 years, what do you think has been some of the highlights for the engagement of, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples uh, globally? Uh, yeah, pulling it in, everybody. Uh, my name is Maggie Walter. As Ian said, I'm talking to you from uh, Len Muhanina country here in Luchawida, Tasmania. Um, and yes, just to follow up also on Ian's point, I'm Distinguished Professor of Sociology at the University of Tasmania, but now moving to emeritus status because I've taken up uh, a role, a very important role, as a commissioner on the Uruk Justice Commission, Australia's first truth-telling Royal Commission. Uh, and we've just started our work, but it's, it's a very exciting space. And I really commend uh, the state of Victoria 
for actually having the foresight and the and the willingness to go where the rest of Australia has not gone yet. So that there's two um, things for me that have that I've personally been involved with that have really been big shapers of my career, but also uh, big shape, shapers of how we do uh, Indigenous business here in Australia. The first is the academic one, and that was the formation of the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association. The strange name indicates it was started by a small group of Native American scholars, but quickly became global. And that started in 2009. I was the first secretary and lots of other Australians have been involved with it. Aileen Morton Robinson is the president elect this year. Uh, Bronwyn Fredericks has been involved. But that brought together global uh, Indigenous scholars from around the, the world, started with 100 people. It's now got well over 1,000 highly contested places each, each uh, year that we can run it. And it has really become the site of high quality Indigenous scholarship and Australians are there. The second one is around data and especially Indigenous data sovereignty. So as you all know, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are culturally and linguistically diverse, but you wouldn't know it if you looked at the data. It's just about the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population. We are also culturally and uh, diverse from Indigenous peoples in other nations. But again, you wouldn't know it if you looked at the data. So if you look at the data in New Zealand, in the US, in Canada, it has exactly the same tropes of Indigenous deficit and Indigenous need that are found here in Australia. And that is what sort of has brought together um, Indigenous peoples, Indigenous leaders, tribes, iwi, um, First Nations, to actually try and do something to make the data better suit the purposes of Indigenous peoples, but more as importantly, better suit the, the what should be the purposes of the nation state. Because at the moment, the data that we're getting in all of these places, including Australia, doesn't really serve anybody. It's just a continuation of a pattern um, stuck on a permanent loop of 1996, really. Uh, it doesn't get improved from there. So the Indigenous data sovereignty movement was born really in 2016 um, at a uh, a workshop, an international workshop held at the ANU, but of course the complaints and the concerns go way back further than that. And everybody who came had the problem that we had an Indigenous data paradox. We had way too much of the data that's about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people or First Nation or Māori that was negative, that was about need, how poor we were, how overcrowded our houses were, how low weight were the babies, and none of the data, or almost none of the data that we actually needed for nation building. And so that is the drive of that. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in the second question. So I'll hand over to Tony now. Thank you, Maggie. Yama, hello everyone. I join you today from Turrbal Nation up in Brisbane, the north side of Brisbane. Uh, pay my respects to other First Nations people here and to the nations of which you join this forum. Um, so I'm gonna provide a couple of examples of work that I've done principally in Indigenous education uh, with international connections. Uh, I suppose the, the advent of technology, particularly um, international trans, transportation sounds like a novel idea nowadays, but um, through the advent of technology and, of course, um, international travel, we've been able to connect with First Nations groups um, th throughout the world. Um, not only in adverted commas, the usual suspects, as I might call them, in terms of other colonised nations, principally Canada, US, New Zealand, but also um, the Nordic nations, uh, Sami nations, and increasingly uh, First Peoples closer to home in the Asia Pacific. Um, and I want to share a couple of examples of work where First Peoples have been a driving force. Um, the first one is a project I was in, involved in when I was at the Australian Council for Educational Research. 
And that was with uh, the OECD uh, in a project led by Canada, uh, looking at promising practices in Indigenous education. Now, government was a big player, lead player in that, simply by virtue of the fact that the partnership was with the OECD. However, through the development of that project, First Nations Voices, whether directly or indirectly through literature and case studies, was you know, at the fore of the conversation as it ought to be. Um, you know, a further example of some of the deficit discourse that Ian and Maggie talk to or allude to, um, nowhere is that more uh, on show, if you like, than in the education sector. Um, we talk about, you know, not only gaps, uh, but deficits catching up, um, being behind, um, and often the measures uh, are simply too crude. Uh, and I'm referring to standardised testing regimes. Um, now, there is ample evidence both domestically in Australia and internationally through PISA and other regimes. Yes, our children, our young learners, um, when measured in kind of Western measures, are behind, so to speak. Um, what we don't measure sufficiently is other aspects of the whole child, of the whole learner. Um, and through international work, you know, we've been pushing this case. If you look at a young learner, whether they're, you know, black, white or brindle, um, what's important is seeing the whole child. And I think First Nations educational advocacy has been at the forefront of those conversations, particularly when you consider a, a young person needs to develop not only academically, but physically, uh, socially, emotionally, and, in, in, and indeed spiritually. Um, and then there's a, a kind of parallel conversation which um, is starting to emerge in international uh, engagement and literature around First Nations education. Um, and that is to challenge, if you will, non-Indigenous learners about their understanding of history, of culture, and indeed uh, learning that grounds them in kind of citizenship, um, which goes beyond 230 years. Um, a second quick example of um, international engagement uh, with First Peoples um, is some work uh, that was once conducted. Um, un unfortunately, the association's not active any longer, but for a good 20 years, uh, Australia was engaged in a forum called uh, the Asia uh, Pacific uh, Bureau of Adult Education. It was looking at the provision of basic education and adult education to disadvantaged peoples in the Asia Pacific. Now, um, we hear a lot in policy discourse about, uh, and quite rightly, um, the inequities where it comes to gender, um, particularly in nations where um, the universal right to an education is often, <clears throat> excuse me, is often denied to girls and women. Um, but equally in that kind of rights and equity based movement and argument, uh, First Nations people have been at the forefront of that advocacy. The big challenge, however, in public policy, both here in Australia and internationally, I would argue, in education um, is not the strength of the advocacy because it uh, has grown year by year, year by year. Um, but um, the, 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 the monumental failure of policy implementation. And that remains kind of uh, the big gap in my mind in terms of um, this kind of aspiration that nations pursue in Indigenous education and then the reality of implementation on the ground. For me, that's the gap. Um, 
but anyhow, there are a couple of examples I'll throw back to you here. Okay. So I'm going to um, ask a, a second question really about um, where, where do you both think that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have really shaped global thinking? Um, I, I might start by um, acknowledging, I think, uh, particularly for me, that uh, most of my global engagement hasn't necessarily, wasn't necessarily shaped up to change the globe, but was actually in some, in some cases just quite simple reaching out to find, find colleagues, uh, find people I could talk to that I didn't have to explain the whole world to. Um, and, uh, and also find colleagues that you could feel safe with. Um, so I, I remember very early on, at one of the first um, Pacific Region Indigenous Doctors Congress, uh, a meeting in Hawaii, I think it was about 2001, 2000. Um, again, there were, were a small number of Aboriginal doctors by that point. Um, I had uh, graduated um, at the University of Melbourne um, um, uh, as the first uh, Indigenous doctor there, one of the first couple in Australia. Um, and I remember being at the closing plenary of this, it was a relatively small meeting of about 100 people, and um, just bursting into tears because really for the first time I felt like I was in a professionally safe space, uh, a professionally safe space uh, with colleagues, uh, which was very um, different from my whole experience as in medical education as, and as professional. But, but I think um, to go to my reflection on where I think um, uh, indig uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have contributed to global thinking is really about models of healthcare uh, and particularly growing out of the Aboriginal community controlled health services, models of primary healthcare uh, and shaping thinking, not, not just as contributors, but also as learners and, and learners in a, in a shared space, but particularly for some jurisdictions that hadn't had the luxury in history of growing up in that particular model of care, such as in the United States. So there was a particular influencing uh, piece that I think became very relevant to uh, our Australian contribution as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people into thinking uh, and into policy and into healthcare practice, particularly in, in uh, Indigenous primary healthcare systems. Um, I, might start, uh, I might go in the same order if, if that's right. So um, Maggie, did you have a reflection on where you think Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have really shaped global thinking and practice? Yeah, again, and I, again, I'll, I'll bring back to Indigenous data sovereignty because it is a movement which is now having serious impact right across the globe, including here in Australia. Uh, New Zealand now has an Associate Minister for Māori data and Māori data sovereignty is part of that her purview. So it has entered the lexicon and Australia and Australian uh, activists, leaders and scholars have been there right through and are still right there um, in leading and working on this advocacy. So just to remind people, Indigenous data sovereignty is defined as the right of Indigenous peoples to own, control, access and possess data that derives from them and which pertains to their members, knowledge systems, customs, resources and territories. Now that's a global definition and that's one of the first benefits because by having a global definition, it not only gives the concept some legitimacy, it also thwarts the tendency of some non-Indigenous policy advisors and others to take Indigenous-derived concepts and reshape them and reframe them to what makes sense to them and also into something that's more amenable to their own aspirations. So by having that global definition, that's it. You can't change it. You can't call it. If you want to do something else, do something else. But don't you dare call us Indigenous data sovereignty. Okay. We're also being a leader in the, um, so Mayam Nairi Wingara, uh, the Australian Indigenous Data Sovereignty Collective. We are one of the four main networks. Networks. So we have, and we formed up in 2017. Uh, we're very active in the um, leadership space, in the intellectual leadership space, and we're moving now more into the um, accreditation space, developing courses, etc. But we work hand in glove with the US Indigenous Data Sovereignty Network, with the First Nations Indigenous Governance Centre, and with the Tamana Oranga 
uh, Mari Data Sovereignty Network. And the benefit there is that we actually can leverage off what other groups are doing in their various things to actually inform what we do and vice versa. So for example, in 2019, we all came together with our smaller affiliate, affiliates from Mexico, Sami nations, uh, the Basque country, um, and a few other places to form the Global Indigenous Data Alliance. And that moves us that one step ahead. And, you know, we benefit from things like, you know, in New Zealand, we've got the Titanga in Technology Project out of what University of Waikato, that's looking at transforming, transforming data ecosystems um, and looking at how Maori customary protocols and Indigenous knowledges inform the construction of digital identities. So we're part of that. Uh, in the US, we've seen how uh, the data network there has worked with the tribes to actually get the US Census Bureau to publish the data the tribes want, not just what the government wants, and also not publish the data that tribes don't want made public. And here we actually ran a summit just to finish off in 2018, where we um, of 50 Indigenous leaders from across Australia, we developed up uh, a set of Indigenous data sovereignty protocols for Australia. And that set of principles is now being used as an exemplar by the other Indigenous data sovereignty networks. So we are leading, but we are also benefiting from our global connections and uh, the work is a moving apace. Thanks, I'll hand to Tony. Thanks, Maggie. Um, I think what you have just shared highlights the role of universities in uh, collaborating and providing spaces for First Nations peoples to connect and exchange information and knowledge, etc. Um, I would suggest there are other parts of our society that could do, could learn from that and do a lot more in the space. And I'm particularly thinking of schools education and through the work I've done, including the project with the OECD, I saw both some strengths of international collaboration, but also sizable room for improvement, um, particularly in connecting practitioners um, in schools education um, was the area I was looking at. Uh, there is sizable scope for that connection. But returning to the, if you will, academic side of things, the uh, as well as the strengthening of data sovereignty networks that you've been at the forefront of. Um, as a researcher, one of the um, real benefits of that international connection is, of course, insights into First Nations methodologies. And the that has allowed, I think, First Nations peoples to find voice within the research community and conducting research activity in a way that's fit for purpose, um, not to, of course, um, overlook the fact that something that's far more culturally safe and indeed culturally robust. Um, it's through international engagement that you kind of come across uh, pearls and gems like one study uh, in anthropology that came from Canada. And it is the single uh, most memorable paper title that I could recall. And the title of the paper was A Year Shared um, uh, Drinking Tea. And what the paper in fact highlighted and it was a first nations researcher early career researcher in in canada was the fact that before any data can be collected you've got to establish relationship and so her paper she called it a year spent drinking tea because before she conducted interviews with the first nations groups that she was working with she of course had to establish trust and a relationship um, and then you can collect data and it it, it 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 makes perfect sense but what it 
highlights to me in terms of um, a key lesson to us in the scholar um, in the scholarship community is that um, you've got to give First Nations research time. And, and, and time is of the essence, but in a different way. Um, so th that's been a key learning for me in, and it could only come through international engagement. The other thing I'll add very quickly in terms of the strength of these international collaborations. Um, I recall the times that I've engaged in research with other First Nations people and the overwhelming sense of relief I had when I found out that a lot of our experiences, whilst unique in Australia, uh, a lot of our experiences are shared. Um, and I found relief in that, not, not because of the fact that, you know, to discover, discover pain or um, firsthand kind of recounts of some, you know, really troubling stories internationally, but the fact that we're not alone and, and that's a very, very strong thing to, um, to, to embrace, that we, we do have some shared experiences, notwithstanding our unique learnings. The other the beauty of international collaboration I've found is that um, when you get to meet elders from other countries, um, I recall when I was in Edmonton in Canada, and I went to shake an elder's hand. He was a chief. Um, he said, no, Tony, left hand. And he wanted to shake me by the left hand. And, uh, and I was a bit puzzled. And he said, this way, you're closer to my heart. So he wanted to shake on the left. And uh, it's just one small example of, you know, finding these knowledge elders, uh, you know, throughout the world which is a, a, a big plus. But I want to quickly come back before we're going back to you, Ian, to where I started. Whilst there are these emerging networks that are, I think are going to benefit First Peoples here in Australia and internationally, uh, there are still sizable gaps, particularly in key areas of practice. And I would include um, schools education in that. One of the kind of one of the true legacies of an indigenous global data movement is to point locally, to point locally to the need to produce data and information that indigenous leaders can use on the ground to make changes uh, in their community uh, at home. Um, and there were a number of times where I thought that was kind of for me where the practice of that was just um, um, reshaping my entire thinking. I, there, was a, there was a moment, and I'll make this my final comment, and I'll go to Maggie and Tony for you to make some final comments. Um, in a community meeting in the Yorta Yorta country in Shepparton, where um, the Victorian Education Department chose to release for the first time after collecting data on Indigenous outcomes, disaggregating data on Indigenous outcomes, to actually start to release that data to Indigenous communities in Victoria. Um, and they did that regionally. Um, <clears throat> and I, I still think that was profoundly troubling that over 20 years, they didn't think it was ethically inappropriate to collect data without releasing it back to Indigenous communities. But they were having a conversation and the conversation was we were leading with about 40 Indigenous leaders from across the community was on the uh, difficult issues for transitioning from year 12 uh, to employment uh, for that very small part of the Indigenous community that weren't going on to TAFE education, or well, actually larger part in Shepparton for TAFE or to university. Uh, and one of the predictors of success was um, re reasonably well established was actually the number of Aboriginal kids that would take up um, broader employment preparation in, in upper secondary schools, such as um, prep for interviews, getting driver's licenses and all that stuff. And someone commented, uh, the education department said that well, 50% of the Aboriginal children uh, in this region do not have that education in, in part of their high schooling 
And um, the room were kind of deeply troubled by that until somebody actually said, so you're telling me for the first time that this is a, this is a problem in our community. Can you tell me how many kids you're talking about? And the bureaucrat went down and said, okay, well, um, 20, 20 kids, 20 kids every year are not getting access. And then suddenly the problem became manageable rather than uh, um, a meaningless percentage. A, it was the first time that, that that information was shared and B, it became a manageable problem. And that's the power of information being provided locally. But again, also the power of the thinking around uh, Indigenous data sovereignty. So, so um, Tony, did you have any, we're going to pop off in about two minutes. Um, did you I would, any... yep. Thank you, Ian, and thanks everyone for joining. I would just quickly take this opportunity to remind people that data is not just numbers, it's not just statistics, and we can't overlook the fact that data also includes narrative and story, which that, and that provides meaning and is more likely to be contextually kind of, um, um, I don't know, important to First Nations people. Um, so when we say data, let's not think, let's not limit it to uh, numbers. And there are many, many stories out there that ought to be heard in improving policy outcomes. Thanks, Ian. Okay. Maggie. Uh, look, just to finish, data is the lens by which Indigenous populations are made visible. It tells nation states and it tells us what can be seen and also what can't be seen. And I think Ian's point about the community lens, that's the benefit of Indigenous leadership, is that we would not do anything that was not community linked. So it's a different way of thinking, different way of doing data, and the benefits are enormous. So, uh, Walika. Thank you. Um, so everyone, I said, Monica, um, thank you all. Um, it's been uh, a great way to start a spring morning. Um, uh, we started a journey talking about um, the, the history of Indigenous engagement with the globe, uh, some of the um, impactful areas in which our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have contributed to global thinking. Uh, and then finally, to reflect on what governments might learn what the Australian government might learn from some of that. And then finally, we, we, we wound our way back from the global right down to the local and the power of uh, local data. So thank you, everyone. Uh, it's been a great conversation and go well for the rest of the Leadership Forum.